Hello there, and a very warm welcome to Season 2, Episode 4 of People Soup. It's Ross McIntosh here. I've got another copper soup for you this week. I'm presenting some evidence and ideas, this week before a live studio audience, comprised of Basil and Fiona. They don't appear to be overly impressed at the moment, but hopefully they might warm up as we progress. You can check out their photo as the icon for this episode. This week's episode is called, What Are You Two Clucking About?, What I'm going to do is present some research in the field of gender at work and a discussion piece and then have a go at linking them together to reflect on what we can do in the workplace. Let's kick off with an example. A friend of mine told me this story a couple of years ago. At the time, she was a finance director for a private company. She'd arrived early for a board meeting, as had the HR director, so they took the opportunity to catch up on the progress of a project that was split between their areas. The HR director was also a woman. After about 15 minutes, the rest of the board, all males, arrived. One of them said as he entered the room, Ha ha! What are you two clucking about? Now, what do you reckon, pea supers? Would the guy have said this to two male colleagues who had arrived early for a meeting? I suspect not. Now, you might say that there have been many positive moves in gender equality at work, and there have. But we shouldn't get complacent. Don't imagine it's all sorted. We only need to look at the gender differences in pay to realise that there's a long way to go. Do we need to take more emphatic action? Do we need to accelerate the change? What can us organisational psychologists bring to the table? I'd say, as a starting point, two words. Evidence and research. Let's go to our reviews. Last week's episode was called, Are You OK? I'm here for you. And we had a cracking response from people. Anna said, over on Instagram, Love this, Ross really made me think about how I can encourage this conversation in my workplace. Now, I happen to know that Anna is in a senior HR role, so I'm hoping that she might be reporting back sometime with what she's tried. Thanks for the feedback, Anna. Chris said, an excellent episode. Lots of things to highlight. Key one, on the sharing of experience and conversations that open up around mental well-being, especially us men. It can save lives. And from Fiona, who said, Ross, a little bit of feedback from me to your mind. I was opening this up this morning and was only delighted it was 15 minutes as I was pushed for time. Just wanted to reinforce your flexible format because it's been hard to get the longer interviews. Also, Fiona said, I love the feedback section. It really gives a community feel for me and that's genuinely a core value. Really enjoyed this one today. So glad you're doing these. Thanks a lot, um, Fiona, Chris and, and Anna. Really nice to hear that people are listening, people are getting stuff out of this, and people are so, so generous, kind, and supportive in in what I'm trying to do. Can't thank you enough. One last point. Some people didn't understand my accent in the review section last week. I said Ross Harris, as in Russell Harris, not Ross Harris. Ross Harris is the guy in Australia who is an absolute legend of act, a pioneer of act, and makes it accessible through books, courses, and YouTube, etc. He wrote one of the first books I ever read on act, called The Happiness Trap, which kind of got me hooked. And yes, so Russ Harris was the one who appreciated Season 1, Episode 1, with Nick Hooper. So it feels like we've kind of arrived, people. I've now got three interviews definitely scheduled, and discussions ongoing for more. We've got Mike Sinclair, who's consultant psychologist and clinical director at City Psychology Group. We've got a double act of Paul Flexibabes Flaxman and Joe Oliver. Paul happens to be my boss at City Uni. He's a reader in psychology at City University of London. And Joe Oliver is a consultant clinical psychologist and director of contextual consulting. And Raphael Dubois, who's a mental performance coach for the Blue Jays baseball team. Okay, let's get down to business. The first paper I'd like to have a go at presenting to you is called Think Crisis, Think Female, The Glass Cliff and Contextual Variation in the Think Manager, Think Male Stereotype. Bit of a mouthful, I'll try and break that down. The paper is by Michelle Ryan, University of Exeter, Alexander Haslam and Mette Hersby, University of Exeter, and Renata Bongiorno from the University of Queensland, 2010. So, firstly, the title of this paper. Let me tell you a bit about the glass cliff. The evidence has suggested that women are more likely than men to be appointed as leaders in times of poor company performance. This means that women could be placed in precarious leadership positions based on female stereotypes, such as being able to manage people, 
deliver difficult messages and can take the blame for organisational failure. Hmm. The Think Manager Think Male Association underlies many gender inequalities in the workplace. Some research in the 70s by Shine, where participants were asked to rate particular traits of managers from successful companies, found that stereotypically masculine traits like being forceful, being decisive, were almost twice as likely to be selected as stereotypically feminine traits, for example, being neat and sophisticated. And that was the same for men and women taking part in this research. However, more recent research, this association took a different form for male and female respondents. Overall, for male respondents, there was a clear association between descriptions of managers of successful companies and masculinity, but there was no such relationship with femininity. In contrast, female respondents described managers of successful companies in terms of both stereotypically masculine and feminine traits, but they too placed greater importance on the former. So, this research is telling us that context can be a moderator. That means it can influence who we think is most suitable for a role. If a company is doing well, we'd be more likely to select a male for that role. If it's in crisis, research is showing that we could be more likely to appoint a female because of the qualities, the stereotypical female qualities they could display. Hmm. The next piece of research is from the Harvard Business Review, and it's called Women and the Labyrinth of Leadership, and it's by Alice Eagley and Linda Carley. And you may have heard of the glass ceiling, that idea that there is an invisible barrier preventing women from getting to the top of organisations. Eagley and Carley conclude that it's not a glass ceiling, but the sum of many obstacles along the way. And I like this because it really makes intuitive sense to me. It's not just one obstacle. They use the metaphor of the labyrinth to reflect the twists and turns that may be encountered on the route to leadership roles. But it also gives hope there is a viable route. The reasons for the labyrinth are complex and multiple. They include the vestiges of prejudice in organisations... The resistance to women's leadership, and here again it's the clash between two sets of associations, communal and agentic. Women are more associated with communal qualities, compassion, helpful, friendly, sympathetic, interpersonally sensitive, gentle and soft-spoken. Men are associated with more agentic qualities, such as assertion, control, ambition, dominance, self-confidence, forceful and individualistic. The agentic traits are often associated in people's minds with effective leadership. And there's a long history of male domination in the role. And it's kind of difficult to separate these associations. Another reason for the complexity of the labyrinth are the demands of family life. Some women will take career breaks to have a family. And this raises lots of complexities about their return to the workplace, how they're welcomed, all sorts of stuff, which I'll come back to a bit later on. Another reason is the underinvestment in social capital. There's lots of male networks in organisations, which can be difficult to break into. Women tend to have a reduced time for socialising. And then there's also the fact of, A man can ask a man out for a drink at work. Hey, Bob, do you want to go for a drink after work? But if a woman asks a man out for a drink after work, it's kind of like, ooh, what's going on there? There's also that hurdle to to overcome. And this takes us on to the third paper, The Shackled Runner, Time to Rethink Positive Discrimination. It's by Mike Noon from Queen Mary, University of London, 2010. And in the paper, he refers to an evocative image of a shackled runner that was conjured up by US President Lyndon Johnson as he introduced affirmative action legislation in 1965. This was aimed at redressing racial discrimination. Lyndon Johnson said the following, Imagine a hundred-yard dash in which one of the two runners has his legs shackled together. He has progressed ten yards, whilst the unshackled runner has gone fifty yards. At that point, the judges decide that the race is unfair. How do they rectify the situation? Do they merely remove the shackles and allow the race to proceed? Then they could say that equal opportunity now prevailed. But one of the runners would still be 40 yards ahead of the other. Would it not be the better part of justice to allow the previously shackled runner to make up the 40-yard gap? Or to start the race all over again? This is gender equality at work. This is what it's all about. Noon's article argues a case for reconsidering positive discrimination as a viable and necessary policy intervention to speed up the progression to equality in the workplace. It provides counter-arguments to the four main objections to positive discrimination. These are the failure to select the best candidate, the undermining of meritocracy, the negative impact on the beneficiaries, and the injustice of reverse discrimination. He concludes that positive discrimination provides the necessary structural conditions in order for radical, transformative change towards equality. Is this the sort of bold action we need? 
I'm quite impatient about this. It's been so unfair for so long. The people considering this, unfortunately, would probably be white, able-bodied, heterosexual men who have historically benefited from a system that privileges them. So it's kind of not that surprising that people react negatively to this sort of suggested change that removes those privileges. At the moment in the UK, positive action is lawful. This means that employers can choose to hire candidates from underrepresented groups, provided that they are as qualified for the role as other applicants. But positive discrimination is unlawful. But I really like this paper from Mike Noon. I think it's really disruptive and challenging and really makes me think about, is there, a, is there really a case for positive discrimination? So what can we do, P-Supers, in preparing for this episode, really brought into prominence that fairness, for me, is a really important value in my life and my work. And I thought it might be useful to return to Johnny Lyne's idea from Season 2, Episode 2. And that's where he introduced the Jewish concept encapsulated in the Hebrew phrase, tikkun olum, not sure if I pronounced that correctly, um, which translates as world repair. And it's become synonymous with the notion of social action and the pursuit of social justice. And I love this concept of repairing the world. And Johnny's idea of those concentric circles where we start with ourselves. What can we start with ourselves to make broader ripples in organisations? What's the closest concentric circle to us? The gender inequality balance has been tipped for so long in favour of men in organisations. What can we do to redress it? Have a think where you could make an impact in your organisation. Whatever your role. Is it sharing some of the evidence? Please do feel free to do so, and I'll put the references on the show notes for this episode. Is it calling out stuff that you see or experience? Remember, what are you two clucking about? We call these micro-behaviours. Micro-behaviours are tiny, often unconscious things that we say and do, making those around us feel included, valued and motivated, or excluded, unappreciated and disrespected. A lot of the time, people don't even realise what they're saying. My personal preference would be to highlight what they've said and highlight the impact on me or on others. Not in a threatening or accusative way. We've all been mired in this stuff for generations. Maybe a way to approach it using the what are you two clocking about example would be to say, would you say that to two male colleagues as you entered a meeting room? Just want to highlight that and, and think about the words you've used. For our leaders, it's about the cultivation of psychological flexibility and the skill of taking perspective. I can give you examples of micro-behaviours from my own experience. A few years ago, at a senior board meeting, we were awaiting a male minister, who was an out gay man, who was running late for the meeting. A senior leader round the table, a woman, said about the minister, he's been visiting a shipbuilder this morning. He's probably gone down the docks looking for sailors. She then turned to me and said, no offence, Ross. Peace supers, I was flabbergasted. And I wasn't the only person around the table who showed embarrassment or surprise. I did raise the impact of this on me after the meeting. Another was when I was at work a few years ago and realised I had to stay late to finish off an important paper. And there were a few of us staying. And I said to this small group of colleagues who were also remaining, hang on, I just need to go and call my husband. And an extremely senior person said, in a confused and puzzled tone, Ha ha ha, you mean your wife? I said, um, no, my husband. And he just couldn't compute and said, No, you mean you're going to call your wife? I then said, look, insert name here, I know what I said, some men marry men. The penny finally dropped and he was mortified, but he didn't make me feel the most comfortable I've ever felt at work with that exchange. So what can we do to increase the awareness of psychological drivers of prejudice? Sharing research findings is one. Calling out that behaviour? How can we help organisations recognise and explore their own labyrinths and get the aerial view to help women and other minorities, for that matter, find their way through it? So what else can we do? Some ideas are, in recruitment, think about the wording of adverts. Are you using agentic or communal tone? We're aiming for a critical mass of women in executive positions. We're looking for fair and open competition and assessment. We need to address long hours culture in organisations. We need to ensure our policies are family friendly. We need to welcome and support women back from maternity leave. We need to look at social capital in organisations, thinking about how the existing structures are typically male-based, going for drinks, playing golf, 
and thinking how they can exclude rather than include a diverse range of people. And we need to prepare women for leadership with suitable stretching assignments rather than always giving them to men. Let's talk about the takeaway. Again, I have to be clear, I don't have in-depth expertise in this area, P-supers, but I hope you found the research I presented interesting and thought-provoking. I'd love to get a guest on who is an expert in this field, so if you do know someone, please point them in my direction. So what can we do? We can share evidence. You can share the evidence I presented here. Or you maybe you've got your own that you are familiar with, which you could send to me and I could then share. I think this is my key takeaway coming up. Calling it out. I wonder if this is something we can all do. It, calling out these micro behaviours in the spirit of the values of fairness and courage. It's important as part of this fairness that we call out micro behaviours that make us feel included, valued and motivated as well as those that make us feel excluded, unappreciated and disrespected. How can we raise these in different ways, either one-to-one, in interactions and in meetings? Sometimes it's just raising this issue in prominence that makes people think a bit more and kind of jump off autopilot and those things they're saying unconsciously. If you've got ideas and stories around this topic, I'd love to hear from you, both good and bad. And that's about it, P-Supers. Thank you so much for listening. You'll know I'd love to hear from you, so you can get in touch via email at peoplesouppod at gmail.com, on Twitter at peoplesouppod, and on Instagram at people.soup. I'd like to thank Andy Glenn for his spoon magic. But most of all, P-Soupers, I'd like to thank you, you. Thank you so much for listening. Please do get in touch. Please let me know what you think, and have a great week. Bye for now. Hey, Bob, do you want to go for a drink after work?